I could not be happier to be here today. After the year we've all had, um, I live in Indiana, I work in Indiana, and we are just coming out of our one year mark of our first case of COVID. So titling this, Let's Stick Together, I think is really a, a wish for where we're going to go in the new year and ties in very well with my story on addressing the dressing. I do have a number of disclosures. I am a measurevectionist by nature, and as a result, I know the data will set us free. And so I collect data on everything. And when we have success, and oftentimes when we have failures, I share that in every available way. As a result of that, I have a number of relevant industry disclosures. I'm also an adjunct research fellow with Avatar, which was mentioned, and I am a member of both the national and my local board of directors with the Association for Vascular Access. And with that, I do need to state that the views I'm going to present are mine alone, and they do not represent those of Ava unless otherwise stated. And with that behind us, my objectives today, to review the current guidelines and standards regarding vascular access dressing integrity, to discuss the evidence indicating association between dressing disruption and bloodstream infection, and to describe a series of successful interventions designed to improve dressing integrity on vascular access devices. Where we are now as I transition into the rest of the presentation is how can what we do in this amazing multidisciplinary specialty make a difference and how can we help? And you may know that during the first half of calendar year 2020, CMS suspended any financial implications for things like our CLABSI rate, but it came back into discussion and actually um, consideration for the reimbursement or lack thereof in the second half of 2020. And it is definitely alive and well as we go into calendar year 2021. So if you're familiar with the value-based purchasing thresholds, this is how our performance will be judged and it will impact our organization's reimbursement two years down the road. So in 2021, calendar year 2021, where we are right now, our performance, number one, needs to be better than the threshold was for 2020. But that means we actually need to be performing 40% better than we're predicted to. And that's after taking into consideration whether or not we're a teaching hospital, what types of units we have, how many central lines we use. So 40% better than we would be predicted to perform. A lot of us are coming off a year last year that wasn't really meeting our own internal goals let alone the goals set for us by these external bodies. So we have a lot of work to do to quickly get back in alignment, regain anything we may have lost last year, but actually move aggressively towards uh, improved outcomes when it comes to catheter associated infections. So where do we go from here? Uh, the reality is, and this is nothing new for us, but that internal and external pressure to report zero has literally changed how surveillance numbers are collected. There's conversations about practices like adjudication committee, hiding infections, and things that are very, very distasteful to those of us involved in the vascular access and patient safety world. So together, we need to work to ensure that emphasis shifts back to truly getting to zero rather than simply reporting zero. And that's going to have to require us to continue partnering across disciplines so that we can use one another's expertise and get that crucial understanding of the full spectrum beyond just the more traditional infection control strategies. So I know we're in 2021, but I can't help but bring us back to that, I will say glorious day in 2019, when ECRI published their top 10 patient safety concerns that year and peripheral IV infections made that list for the first time. So seeing that progression of a shift to increased awareness of harm and particularly infections across devices beyond just central lines. And then uh, that same year, CDC proposed expanding their surveillance to include all hospital onset bacteremias. Clabsy would remain a subset of that, but looking beyond that. So we could create a framework where every bloodstream infection is evaluated. So public comment ended in 2019. At the annual conference for APIC in 2019, CDC had not yet finished getting through all of the responses they received. I was tickled because I think the majority of that was coming from you guys. Our peers in vascular access sharing the downside that was brought into effect by, by individuals and organizations having that laser focus on CLABSI and then play, uh, paying proportionately less attention to other devices. So, the jury is still out, a final decision has not 
been publicly communicated. We know the standards weren't changed in 2020 for reporting. We know in 2021, there is not yet that mandated or even voluntary expanded reporting. I certainly hope we're gonna to get to the point where that will be there. I am doing my part and will continue collecting that data. But so moving in to the real core of our, our discussion today, which is about dressing integrity and what's in the standards and what's going on with quality improvement. So I am so thrilled that we are now talking about the 2021 infusion therapy standards of practice. And when it comes to recommendations regarding dressing changes and device management and assessment, there are some changes in 2021 that really address a number of the questions that we raised in the 2016 standards. So the standard, the standard statement is the thou shalt, and that's what I have on the left. And as we look into that, the language is very similar to what it was in 2016 in that site care, including skin antisepsis and dressing changes is performed at established intervals and immediately. So they kept the word immediately expressing to me the urgency in this matter if dressing integrity is compromised. And here's one of the big changes in the standards. Previously, they didn't define for us what dressing compromise or a disruptive dressing or a loose dressing was. So we were on our own to determine that in our organizations. And for me, I always struggled because they told us it was an immediate action, but they didn't define at what point we had reached that point of urgent response on the, on the part of our bedside staff. So they've gone on to actually define that in the 2021 standards as lifted or detached on any border edge or within the transparent portion of the dressing. And then it continues with its visibly soiled presence of moisture drainage, compromised skin integrity. Moving into the practice recommendations, language is similar. We're gonna change transparent dressings at least every seven days, except in neonatal patients. And again, the word immediately, if the dressing integrity is disrupted, they reiterate their definition. So lifted or detached on any border edge or within the transparent border of the dressing. And again, if it's soiled, moisture drainage or blood. Um, so sterile gauze, same thing. If you're using sterile gauze, you're changing it at least every two days when you're inspecting the site um, or if the dressing integrity is disrupted. So here they leave it more generic as lucid because it's a different style of dressing. But the new element that was introduced in addition to the definition is to evaluate the beneficial use of gum mask liquid adhesive on adult patients when an enhanced adhesive adherence is necessary, considering the use of a skin barrier film prior to application and ensuring that we're using correct technique when we remove our dressings to prevent catheter associated skin injury. Now I am really excited and really proud of all of the standards, but this particular piece is one that my team at our large community hospital in Northwest Indiana, it's an article that we have recently published that is cited as one of the support items for this. And I'll talk you through that small quality improvement project that turned into a large quality improvement project that turned into a peer reviewed manuscript and how that found its way into the standards. So as I said, we talk about adding gum mastic liquid adhesive, which is what we've done in our organization. The question that originally used to arise with some frequency prior to the 2021 standards is the concern about MARCI or what we use to term medical adhesive related skin injury. There was a series of consensus statements published back in 2013 in JWOCN, so the Jour Journal of Wound and Ostomy and Continence Nursing, and they talk a lot. If you've not read the document, it's so valuable in so many ways as we are, um, I'm sorry, I'm seeing chat box, I apologize. Uh, I don't think slides are frozen, but please unmute if, Judy, if there's a problem on my end. But um, no, you're good. You're good, Jill. In, in the context of all the conversation about protecting the patient's skin, there is also a statement in this document that, that cautions us to consider the potential adverse consequences of insufficient adhesion or adhesive failure when we select our medical products for securing a critical device. In this, they include vascular access devices as a critical device, and they emphasize that proper securement of critical devices is paramount to patient safety. So as we began the conversations at my organization, we knew that 25% of our bloodstream infections in 2016 had documentation of problems with addressing either being reinforced or prematurely changed. We know from the work of Jean-Francois Timzit that having to change a dressing more than twice for disruption has a threefold, greater than a threefold increase in the risk of collapses for the patient. So when we look at what's at stake for not addressing the dressing, 
the risk of increased CLABSI and the morbidity and mortality associated with that really drove us forward in our quality improvement project. So new standard introduced in the 2021 standard. So is there more? There is more. And this affects what we do every day and dovetails so strongly into this topic. So the new standard introduced on catheter associated skin injury and the standard or the thou shalt admonishes us that appropriate interventions need to be implemented to reduce the risk of and manage skin injury. And then I've excerpted parts of the practice recommendations for how the, the vascular access dressing relates to that. So as we're assessing sensitivity to the dressing, number one, considering uh, dressing brand changes, if it's appropriate, if you're having a problem specific to a dressing, but then the actual in-use consideration, so dressing factors like frequent dressing changes and how that could contribute to stripping of the skin. Improper application to technique, I think we've all seen like when the dressing is stretched and it has a memory and it could recoil. So making sure we're not stretching that dressing. Application to moist or wet skin, these are not new concepts, but explicitly calling them out and their potential contributing factors to skin injury, I think is really important. That excessive use of tachifiers and bonding agents and removal technique, you know, that rapid, we wanna go low and slow um, and insufficient support of the skin. And then bringing forward the fact that we need to actually be removing any residual adhesive at the time when we're cleaning the skin. On the other side of the slide and also within the practice recommendations is their recommendations for promoting skin regeneration. So number one, considering the use of medical adhesive removal to minimize skin discomfort and skin damage. Within this section on promoting skin regeneration, they again reiterate the language that they had in the previous standard here to consider the use of gum mastic, again, in select patients when enhanced adhesive adherence is needed. That same language they use earlier in the standards and they will continue to reiterate that we need to change the dressing if it's soiled or not intact. So, new standards, so important, expanding the language beyond just medical adhesive related skin injury to look more holistically at all catheter associated skin injury. I hope you guys were as excited as I was when the new standards came out because there was so, so, so much in there and just reading through and understanding. And if you've not read it yet, the love note that Dr. Ricard wrote, and that's my word, not her, sorry, but in the foreword that for infusion therapy, our hands are not tied behind our backs. Rather, the standards put the strength of knowledge firmly in our hands, freeing us to use them well and wisely. There are so many other gorgeous words she wrote in that forward, but if that does not inspire us to get out and make a difference. Um, all right, so moving on briefly from the infusion therapy standards of practice, because it is not just INS who believes that the dressings matter when it comes to improving outcomes for our patient. So the last full update of the CDC guidelines for the prevention of intravascular catheter related infections was issued in 2011. There's been one small update since then, but they are no longer doing routine operate, uh, updates on their guidelines. So within the CDC guidelines, they have very similar language, certainly not as expansive or as detailed as INS has gone into, but from the perspective of preventing infections, it's replaced the catheter dressing if it's damp, loose, or soiled. So there's no, there's no difference in the recommendation. We don't have to say, but I follow INS. No, we follow CDC. That language is consistent, that the dressing needs to be changed if it's not good. Lest we wonder if these are only American considerations, and certainly CDC and INS are used around the world, but I pull up here the um, EPIC-3 guidelines for the NHS hospitals in England, just to once again demonstrate that that language is consistent. You're not going to find a single evidence-based guideline or standard that says, hey, you know what, if that dressing's a mess, just tape it down and leave it and we'll get back to it tomorrow. So within EPIC-3, it's transparent dressings should be changed if they're no longer intact or there's moisture under the dressing. And if a gauze dressing is used, again, they call it out explicitly, they too need to be changed if the dressing is damp, loose, or soiled. I often say this particular talk or this presentation is one of the, the most fun or easy to give because there's, there's no disagreement between the standards we look at. We're not gonna find something that supports anything other than addressing these dressings and improving what we do with them in hopes of tying it to improve patient outcomes. 
So um, don't look too closely. And I will say these are not from my hospital. Uh, these are images obtained from the Vascular Access and Infusion Specialist Facebook group, which I should probably just give a disclosure. I am one of the administrators and moderators of that site. And these pictures were up there before we had to tighten our recommendations regarding posting photos and also from the avatar page. But when you look at these just as simple examples, do you think we were fully getting the message about the urgency of addressing dressings that weren't meeting our standards? But then the but why question. I mean, we've all had toddlers in our lives, been toddlers in our lives, and sometimes still are. But why do the actual intact dressings matter? So we know it's in the guidelines. We know it's in the standards. We know it's in the literature. But why? And this is a TIMSIT study that I mentioned earlier on in the presentation because TIMSIT demonstrated back in 2012 that dressing disruption is a major risk factor for catheter-related bloodstream infections. And these are the numbers I quote that the risk of major catheter-related infection and bloodstream infection increased by more than threefold after the second dressing disruption and by more than tenfold if that final dressing was disrupted. So this takes it beyond the, we do it because the standards say but we actually need to back it up. So it wasn't good enough to just change the dressing immediately, which is I think what we were doing is we were in our pre-intervention phase, like we were on it, that dressing was loose, we changed it, the dressing was loose, we changed it, and we were going, 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 and we were absolutely following the standards. However, Tim's it showed us that that repeated process of needing to address the dressing or a disrupted dressing was actually a major independent risk factor for bloodstream infection. So as we were moving forward, we began trying to address what we could do to avoid finding ourselves in the situation where we had a disrupted dressing that needed to be changed. So again, a great article for helping us understand the why. So when we began our journey, and once you start looking, it's like so many things, like peripheral IV infections as well. But as you start looking, something that maybe you've never measured before, never been part of your surveillance scope or your process measures, and we began to realize that it wasn't only in our patients who developed infections that we had opportunities for improvement regarding our dressing, but as we were doing large scale point prevalences, we were finding this to be a significant concern throughout the organization on many devices. And as I start reaching out to my peers and going to the literature, I couldn't find a whole lot of people who could actually tell me what their dressing disruption rate was, which to me was very curious because the standards were so strongly worded on what we were supposed to do. But I did find a number of studies that were helpful. So this was actually the Cascade trial. This was the original pilot for the Cascade trial. And in it, they were really focusing on securement of picks, but within it, there's a lot of information that had to do with the dressings as well. So they went through a series of different configurations, I called it Frankensteining, but where they went through the different configurations of how to secure their dressing. There was subcutaneous securement, there was tissue adhesive, there was a honeycomb, there were all different kind honeycomb dressing, not an actual honeycomb, let me clarify. Um, great for wound healing, but that's not what they're talking about here. But they tried all these different configurations. And as we look down on how their dressings did, so dressing slash securement device life, days to first change, 1.71, 0.94, 1.83, 1.49. And if we know our goal is seven days or depending on your policy, five to seven days, none of those were even beginning to approach that despite all the different configurations they had. And there's certainly a lot of reasons that go into why dressings fail. It's not just because of adhesion failure, but dressing lifting, which is the closest thing to what we're looking at, I could pull out of there. Um, it was 26%, 50%, 22%, and 47% that were in fact related to a lifted dressing. So it was one of the studies I was able to look at. And again, it was a, it was a small, it was their pilot, but looking to say we weren't alone in finding that there were significant opportunities for improving dressings. And then I found Richardson's study as they went through to look at ways to improve their, sorry guys, improve their dressing integrity. So they looked at a number of different dressings that were out on the market. And these are pretty decent sample sizes, two and 300 uh, dressings for most of the dressings they were looking at. And when you look at the dwell time for those dressings, the median dwell time, 43 hours, 46 hours, 40 hours, 68 and a half hours. Again, not even beginning to approach 
a seven day dressing change. And then when they looked at the subset of those, that was non-adherence, clammy skin or bleeding. So an even narrower focus and more in alignment with specifically what I'm talking about today, those numbers dropped even further where we're at 36 hours, 45 hours, 32 hours, 53 hours. So again, we're not alone, but there wasn't a whole lot of data being collected and presented across this topic. I think the dressing was just something that we always assumed we would have to do something to improve. And of interest, when I went back and looked at their data, they shared that was kind of sequential phases of their continuous evaluation. And what caught my eye is in phase two, they were actually using a dressing with a uh, bordered securement dressing. And they were proactively adding another window pane with Hypofix around to create a further integrated border. So I actually emailed Annette Richardson because I wasn't sure I was reading this right. So they took a border dressing and they pre-enforced it. That's not a real word. Please never, never use it. Please don't attribute it to me. But they were pre-enforcing, they weren't reinforcing the dressing. They were putting another border on a border dressing from the outset. And I emailed her to make sure that I wasn't misinterpreting and she verified that was in fact what they did in that phase. So looking back at their data here, when they did that, which is the third, um, the third item listed on here, when they window paint their securement dressing, so added another layer basically of tape around it, it actually performed less favorably than their plain dressing. So again, that's, that's my interpretation of what they published, but it was really interesting to me because I think that's what some of our nurses were looking to do. Can we just tape it down right off the start? This is one piece, one small study that suggests maybe that wasn't going to get the outcomes they needed. So as we moved into our quality improvement, so back in 2017, there was a lack of consistency on what was intact. When's it okay to reinforce? And is it okay for edges to be lifted or rolling up? As we look into the standards that I already shared, 2021 has now answered a lot of those questions for us. So according to the standards that we need to do that immediate dressing change, if it is lifted or detached on any border edge. So that is where I said that definition coming out in the standards is huge because it, it really defines, because it's a definition of when do we need to take that immediate action. So that was exciting to me um, as we looked in hindsight at what we did and what is now in the new standards. So where else do the standards help us? Again, I'm a self-declared data nerd, um, but quality improvement is part of what we all do every day in our role. And so when we look at quality improvement and how the standards are gonna help us get where we need to be to improve patient outcomes, specifically need to incorporate surveillance, aggregation, analysis, and reporting of patient quality indicators with clinicians taking action as needed to improve practices, processes, and systems. And I know these standards are still new to, well, to all of us because they just came out in January. So I'm spending a little bit more time actually reading the words because I know many of us are. So it's 230 pages this time, which by the way is double what it was in 2011. So just trying to highlight some of the words that might help you as you move forward. And so audit and feedback when implementing changes in practice understanding the rationale for practice changes in your audit activities. So connecting to mission, why are we doing it? And making sure there's actually a link between what you're auditing and the outcomes you're trying to address. One of my other exciting pieces that um, I read in here is that we need to share the improvements gained through these processes both internally and externally. And that's what you'll see with our story. You start with what you're learning inside and then we share it amongst our peers in the appropriate manner so that we can affect change beyond just the walls of our own organization. And also within the standard, it's very exciting to see the language regarding what we do for central lines and what we do for peripheral and arterial lines is almost identical. So what I've excer excerpted here is a language regarding evaluating adverse events from peripheral and arterial devices, so bloodstream infections, infiltration, phlebitis, whether you're doing incidence point prevalence, reviewing records or ICD-9 codes. The fact that that is in there, and it's that same language, slightly, slightly different because we already do these things for central lines, but this is in here as an expectation. 
And there's one other piece because I know not everyone's comfortable gathering data, collecting data, analyzing data and have it fed back to you. But the spirit of this is truly quality improvement. So also within the practice recommendations, the standards say that we should foster a just culture and individual accountability through a focus on improving our systems and processes by clinicians and leaders. So this is about our own accountability to the care we give, or those of you who give care, and the outcomes our patients receive. And it's not about somebody doing it to us, it's doing it with us and in many ways for us. So we all want to get better to moving beyond the I'm being, I'm being watched, I'm being followed, I'm being judged. We're gathering data to help make everything we do every day for every patient better. And I think that just culture is hopefully already well embedded within your organizational culture, but it's, it's definitely called out as part of the standard. All right, so product evaluation, because the next thing might be after those audit and feedback cycles, realizing there may be need for change. So clinician end users are involved in the evaluation of vascular access device and infusion products, right? We, we may have recommended products or restrictions based on us through purchasing agreements, but we need to be at the table, you as vascular access and infusion specialists, when you are evaluating your organization, organization is evaluating items related to your specialty. But also there's an expectation that as individuals in the field that we attain and maintain knowledge about developments and technologies related to vascular access devices. There's, there are years between these standards being published. There will be new interventions, new devices, new products. It's up to us to keep our knowledge current and continue recommending improvement. So within product evaluation, this too makes my heart sing. We need to know what we're going to measure. When we go to do a pilot, a trial, an investigation, we want to know what it is we're going to measure and evaluate so that we can define in advance the parameters that must be met for evaluation to be considered successful. My team, and I think, I think some of them are on the call, I always challenge how will we know we've won? So when we're going and we're looking at the next new widget, the next new toy, the next new process change, how do we know we've won? And I love that this is explicit in the standards because if you don't define that in advance, you're gonna find yourself adopting things that aren't actually achieving your goals. Also ensuring that your intended use of the product is actually in alignment with what the product is intended to do. It does say you need data collection tools for analysis and ongoing monitoring. Your monitoring is not a one and done, it's an ongoing thing. And then not to be afraid to include our manufacturers in our product evaluation. We need education and training for everything we're using in the organization and who better to help us than the manufacturers. So lots and lots of good stuff in that standard to help us move forward. So as we posed our question, how do we make it better? Again, so exciting to see what's included in the standards, but these were our early questions. Do you start with clean skin? What is clean skin? Every CHD preparation we use tells us we need clean skin. Do you use skin prep? And understanding those mean two different things to do different people. We all, I hope, use skin prep, meaning CHD or alcohol, whatever you're using to prep your sites. But what about skin prep, um, like the barrier films? Are those being used? Do you let everything dry? Is your securement hindering or helping in maintenance? We know there's a complete buffet of options out there for securing our devices. Is what you're using allowing you to get the best possible outcomes for that device? Is additional securement or adhesive necessary? And is adhesive remover necessary? So again, language in the latest version of the standards that helps us through those conversations, but excuse me, we were having these back in 2017. So it can be done. Um, again, images from the Vascular Access Infusion Special Group, as well as Laura Crick and Dr. Jack Ladon. So there are ways to get better. Not every, every patient is perfect, not every insertion is perfect, but with some thoughtful planning, we can make a difference and we can improve things from where our baseline is. So I always pause to remind myself and everyone that this is not just about inpatients. So our original focus was on our inpatient setting, but we also have a large home health associated with our organization. And it was brought to our attention by a patient that we had a different standard of care after we originally implemented, he was seeing great outcomes while he was in our hospital. And then he went to our home health 
and found that he wasn't receiving the same products and the same standards and he was back to dealing with disrupted dressing. So it's a great reminder. Um, you place your devices, you put all your love and care into them, you send your patients out into the wild, but what are they taught? Because the standards of practice apply throughout the continuum of care. How many dressings are disrupted when you go out there to see the patient? Are there extra visits necessary to assess those dressings? And how does that affect reimbursement? It's a little bit different from what we look at on the inpatient side, but there is definitely an opportunity. Many of you probably saw the same photos I did a year or two ago where somebody had actually arrived with their dressing duct taped back on. I kid you not, that was one I would have loved to have shared, but the individual was um, many, many visible tattoos, which as you know, with HIPAA is a no-no. And I started like, photoshopping the picture and that's also not cool. So um, we'll leave it to the imagination, but literally duct taping dressings back on is really not in a patient's best interest. So how do you measure the impact? If this is something that's of interest to you, many of your infection prevention teams have probably just done their annual report and risk assessment for last year. Work with them, go back and find out how many CLABSIs, bloodstream infections, had premature dressing changes last year. They may have to go back or let you go back and review the chart, but it's also a great time to look at how many times are we reinforcing dressings. Many of us are using electronic medical records. You can have your report writers generate reports to help you identify how many dressings are changed before day five, before day seven, reinforce at the time of removal. We can use our EMR to help us look at a large number of patients beyond just what we're looking at with our eyes. But it always, in my opinion, needs to be coupled with prevalence rounds or shoe leather epidemiology. Go out there, go to the GEMBA, listen, look, and find out what's going on. So we review dressing on all of our units. It's stratified by anatomical location, line type. And when we began this process, we were very clear on identifying where the breakdown was. Was it fully intact? Was it lifted? Was it reinforced? Was the insertion site exposed? So as you think about quality improvement, um, I'm here to be a downer for a moment. There are no shortcuts to success. The standards apply to all care settings and cherry picking the easy art parts is not really a viable option. Um, I learned this unfortunately while I was, what do you say? Um, I was in court being interrogated by opposing counsel and was accused of having cherry picked the standards for decisions we made on patient care with the organization I was with. I can tell you we didn't cherry pick because what was being in question was an unresolved issue. But when you go through the standards of practice, the CDC guidelines, the Canadian guidelines, understanding that all of these elements interact with one another and you can't just pick out the one you want because there are probably five, six, 12 other things that go along with it to achieve the outcomes. So um, I've said I'm a data nerd, but I will continue to encourage everyone to find ways to gather that data, collect that information and make a difference with it. Earlier in the year, we published our Jamboree, bringing it all together in uh, IVIQ, Ava's newsletter, because I'm so proud of the work our team has done at Methodist Hospitals, because we every month before COVID would host a vascular access Jamboree. And every month it was an interdisciplinary team of hospital experts and our industry experts for every central line product and peripheral IV product we used. And we would go and we would round for hours at the bedside. And then we would collaborate afterward to decide what are we gonna do so that things get better before we get back together next month. And it's an absolutely one of the most fun things I've had an opportunity to be involved with. And I'm thrilled for the partnership with my colleagues at the hospital, as well as our partners with industry. And then in January this year, this concept of being bean counters, um, I've been called that many times, but it's not about bean counting. Like the data will set us free. So we can't just let our data and our numbers live on a log or a spreadsheet somewhere. We need to gather it and then we need to use it to drive improvements. And that is very strongly in the standards. And for those of you who may be magnet recognized facilities, you know that we have to live and breathe quality improvement if we're going to continue to maintain our accreditation. So looking at the story of how the, the data that we collect and share makes a difference for our peers. At AVA 2014 was the first poster that I saw 
regarding this topic of dressing adherence. And so this was Diane Pullen and, and colleagues, I'm sure, looking at a quality improvement initiative to address dressing adherence, real simple, before and after they were looking at PICs, they were looking at IJs. Housewide initiative, not a huge sample, but they're trying to see was there a difference when they added a gymnastic to their dressings. And if you look at their before and after, after implementing their change, again, just a quality improvement project, they had no totally detached picks. They had no totally detached IJ dressings, which to me at the time was almost unthinkable. I didn't realize, honestly, that people were seeing success with securing these dressings and all their other outcomes were improved as well, edges lifted and partial detachment. So quality improvement project shared, I believe at a poster session at AVA. And then that next year, um, next year at, or two years down the road at AVA in Orlando, another presentation by Sarah Niehaus, Jennifer McCord and uh, from Bethesda North Hospital in Cincinnati, Ohio. So another quality improvement project. And again, looking at IJs, you can tell where our pain points, pain points are as we all look at some of the similar things. So looking at improving adhesion of IJ dressings in the ICU. So critical care units, they looked at a root cause analysis they found increased number of insertions in the IJ site, which had associated problems with dressing disruption, 70% of their dressings being changed before day seven. So it was a 36 patients looked at before, 30 patients looked at after, point prevalence in their IV sites. And you once again can see the improvements, dry and intact going up, edges lifted going to none, partially detached going to none, totally detached going, staying where they were. But it's exciting when we begin to see the reproducibility of results. Small quality improvement products, projects inspire great changes in other organizations. So this is some of the work I was familiar with when we began looking at my own hospital and what we could do better. Jewish Hospital presented at, their AC, at the AACN chapter meeting in 2016. Again, a quality improvement initiative resulting in fewer dressing disruptions and improved adherence to best practices. They also monitored in this case, the decrease in CLABSIs using the NHSN definitions as they improved their dressing integrity. So again, just a great, great story as they continued moving forward with looking at ways to measure and improve their dressing adherence. Again, I'm just gonna say reproducibility of results is what starts to change practices on a larger scale. So our story, I've seen those, so I've seen these posters, we're going forward, we're looking in 2016, 25% of all the bloodstream infections in my hospital had documentation in the chart that the dressing had been reinforced or prematurely changed. At that point, we were conducting a series over 18 months of large scale point prevalence studies that were direct observations. When we looked at our peripheral IVs specifically, because that's where most uh, historically, the majority of my research has been, 45% of our peripheral IVs were reinforced, lifted, or completely disrupted. And time after time after time, 15% had an exposed insertion site. So we knew we need to do better, that we wanted to do better on that topic. So going back to what do the now standards say, very exciting to look back and say what we did, what we put in place is actually very much in alignment with the recommendations and the standards on identifying uh, product evaluation. So we were aware of new developments and technologies related to VADs and we learned that by attending our professional conferences, largely AVA specifically on this topic is where we gathered our information. So we took that personal accountability to attain and maintain knowledge. We did establish our clear goals. We knew how we would be, how we would know we won. We had our data collection tools and you're about to see we had lots of ongoing as well as initial monitoring of data. So we, we were on our magnet journey at that time. So our quality improvement effort was approved through infection control committee and shared governance. Our original group was a multidisciplinary team that included vascular access, infection prevention. Nursing was represented through nursing education and our clinical nurse specialists. We don't talk about the skin without bringing in our WOCN, so our wound nurses and materials management because we wanna make sure we're in alignment with the products that we're bringing into trial. We defined our goal because it was not yet written anywhere how we would define intact. So our goal was to achieve 80% of dressings remaining fully intact with all four corners down without reinforcement until device removal or at a seven day dressing change. 
So our pilot study was presented at AVA conference. And I share this too, and I'm a little bit embarrassed to put my little first place ribbon up there, but I share this, not everything needs to be a randomized controlled trial to, to inspire value and inspire change. So I shared the posters that inspired me. We went forward with our pilot study. This was an oral abstract, very small sample sizes. And that year we did win first place for what this meant to others. So our baseline, as I shared, was 55% fully intact dressings, 15% insertion site exposed. As we began the project, we were requested to do additional education. So we did, and that got us only a 2% improvement in our um, fully intact dressings and no change whatsoever with the percent of devices with the insertion site exposed. We were looking at combinations of new dressings, and so we were recommended by our manufacturer to try a slightly different style of the dressing that we were originally using. We actually halted, so that's the one marked as dressing two. We actually halted that arm of the trial. We were trying to see 20 to 30 of each dressing when this was just a pilot study. It was meant to be small. It was looking at feasibility, but we could not achieve what we were looking for based on those original dressings. So we just, we did not spend more time there. And then we began taking the combination of both of our trial dressings, adding gum mastic around the edges. And that's where we found with each dressing, we met and exceeded our goal of 80%. And where I mentioned that we had defined that in advance, we knew how we would win. We would win if we got to at least 80%. Defining that in advance was inherent in any pilot I was going to be a part of or study, but I'm so thrilled that it is explicitly in the standards because when we came out of this, People were really, really excited about that 93%, but we learned after the fact that there was a significant cost variation in those two products. So we moved forward with dressing two plus gum mastic, which met and exceeded our goal and allowed us to do so for our organization in the most financially responsible manner. But um, that would have been a more difficult conversation had we not defined that in advance. So I went that first year to AVA with, you know, 200 or less observations. I came back the next year in 2018 with, let me do that math, over 20,000 observations. So we, we reported our pilot in 2017, and then we moved forward with housewide implementation. These were direct observations. Part of this is that vascular access jamboree I mentioned to you. Part of this is the ongoing prevalence rounds that patient care leadership was involved in at the time, at times seeing over 2,000 and 3,000 dressings a month. So these are direct observations at the bedside. And you can see in our first year of full implementation, we were at 95% fully intact dressings. We were 98% fully intact dressings, but we didn't stop there. We continued to monitor this and we looked over the quarters to see if there were differences what we were seeing. And we actually realized around mid-year 2018, so we've been doing this, we've looked at at this point tens of thousands of dressing. And I think some of our team became what I would call dressing whisperers. You know, we're holding it up and we're seeing the minuscule gaps. That's so important. But we also began to realize at times we weren't even completely covering the hub end of the catheter. And so those were exposed catheters and they were counted in these numbers. And you'll see where our numbers went down slightly. It did not meet our definition of non-intact. Remember our focus was all four corners intact without reinforcement. So we drifted a little bit in our definition. And I just share that because you'll see that variation in the numbers. We continue to go strong. This was in 2019, just showing that we break it out by device type. We look at the impact of observer because our units are doing a lot of the direct observations. We always wanna be able to see if we have any in, um, inherent or um, Hawthorne even effect going on, depending on who is looking at it. So we'll break it out by whether it was the frontline staff, professional development, infection prevention, vascular access team, or our jamboree. And then it gets really ugly, but just sharing the layers that we peel back. So then we go beyond just, is it peripheral IV? Is it a central line? We'll look at anatomical locations so we can see where we have ongoing opportunities. And then addressing one more time that question of catheter associated skin injury. So we have adopted this as our standard of practice in all of our inpatient central line dressing change kits, our peripheral line insertion and dressing change kits. And have we seen an increase in catheter associated skin injury? So we monitored this very heavily and directly in our first 18 months. And that was done through ongoing review of all of our risk control reports, as well as our wound team consultations. 
Every single month, I would review every single risk control report that came through. And because that's a manual process, I would then export it into Excel and I would search for skin, I would search for injury, I would search for tear, trying to see if something had gotten into the incident reporting system that would suggest that what we were doing was increasing patient harm. I didn't find it. But I don't know about you, I don't always have 100% confidence that staff put in an incident report every single time that something isn't quite right. But what I do believe is because we have amazing active and engaged wound nurses, that if there is skin injury, our wound nurses are being called. In addition to that, they do regular housewide skin surveys. And every month when we were doing the Jamboree, we were doing direct assessments of patient lines. We saw no increases. And during that time, just in comparison, our wound nurses had approximately 3,600 skin consultations that they were called on. And those were not associated with any harm from our dressings. We had two vascular access device associated um, incidents that did involve dressings in those first 18 months but neither of those was limited to the dressing border or adhesive. So may have been a contributing factor that um, is something worth looking at, yes, but was it the underlying cause? No, and was it a measurable increase over what we had seen before? Absolutely not. So winding down again, reminding that when we look at catheter associated skin injury, they're talking about the very things that we have now demonstrated through our pilot and then our continued work that we wanna make sure we're putting in interventions to reduce the risk of a managed skin injury, making sure we're really handling our dressings well, that we're gonna minimize frequent dressing changes. We're gonna make sure we're using adhesive removers when appropriate, we're not leaving adhesives on the skin. Um, and then considering for us, which is what we did, whether gum mastic could help us. For us originally, it was for dressing adherence. That's why we brought it in but they consider it here also in their skin generation section, regeneration section, can it help um, to help keep those dressings on? So very excited to see that there. And then finally, it's one more chance to say reproducibility of results. We did a very large scale study in my hospital, but there have now been subsequent posters. So it starts with the posters and it continues with the poster. So at AVEN 2018, Jeminson et al, same thing. They introduced gum mastic as well as tissue adhesive um, in late March, 2018. They saw a decrease in the PRN dressing changes, decrease in bloody dressings, which would be related to the, the tissue adhesive at the insertion site, but a decrease in loose dressings by 16%. They associated that with a cost savings of around $40,000 a year. One more, Aldi et al, also at AVA 2018, a great year. They, they also added gum mastic to their dressing. When they looked at that gold standard for them and how long their dressing stayed on before adding the gum mastic, they were at 2.7 days after they were at five days. When they went into their study, they had 36% non-intact dressings or partially detached dressings. They had none after doing the implementation. So, so exciting for something that was still relatively new to vascular access to see a lot of different teams, a lot of different clinicians really across the country doing something similar and finding similar results. Elena Squires also presented along with South Bergerman at AVA 2019, very similar. They added gum mastic for their CVADs and they had zero early dressing disruptions. It was 33 patients, but that included um, one patient who had their CVAD in for over a month. And that was observation for both partial and detached, partial and complete lifting of the dressing. And they looked at that for improvements in um, supply costs, nurse time, and what goes along with that nursing cost. So we're bundle. Um, it has now been seven years since we implemented our clinical indication bundle. We've made two changes since doing that. In 2017, we added our liquid gum mastic adhesive. In 2019, we did change our needleless connectors to be anti-reflux, but we have added this to our standard bundle for our peripheral IVs, as well as our central lines in our organization. And then this topic of adhesive remover, and this, this truly is conclusion. When I went into this, Dressing removal and adhesive remover was not even part of, my, part of my thinking. I am an infection preventionist. I'm an epidemiologist. This was not part of my day to day. But as I rounded on our patients and went to the bedside again and again and again, while I was trying to assess the integrity of their dressing, the stories that they shared with me time and time again was what their experience was with our dressing removal. 
So Tom Dick published in 2012. He's a paramedic that I've often marveled that the word hospitality is mostly made on hospital, and yet the staff in so many hospitals seem to understand so little about hospitality. And he says this because as he was a patient on the day after surgery, his IV site needed to be retaped because the IV was unstable. To secure it, another nurse simply added more tape circumferentially. Day after another nurse rips the tape off, leaves the original dressing on and just replaces the tape. Are you guys cringing here? He asks her to moisten the tape with alcohol before ripping it off. She tells him that she is too busy. Two days later, he's talking to a fourth nurse. He again has a problem. There's blood backed up into the tubing. And again, they're just ripping the tape off. He asks them to use alcohol. They say they don't have time for it. Sure enough, he advocates for himself with most of our patients can't do or won't do. They use an alcohol pad, everything gets better, tape comes off, but he's treated like a smart ass for making the suggestion. Our patients deserve better, and this is in our hands and in the standards to allow us to do better for them. So please remember, we have a laser focus on central lines. The current standards of practice will help us move and expand what we're doing to include all devices, to include the process measures, as well as the outcomes because truly any line could be your patient's lifeline. And with that, I will pause and I think we're open for questions, right?